On behalf of the Gold Farm Center, Patrice Franco, the director of Gold Farm Center, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this year's first Cotter debate. I'm Sandy Maisel. I actually share the honor of being Gold Farm Professor of American Government uh, and to moderate tonight's debate. I want to tell you just a little bit about the history of the Cotter debates. When President Cotter, uh, who served 20 year, 21 years, I believe, as COVID's president, retired, people were deciding what to do in his honor. And the decision was made because Bill Cotter enjoyed <coughs> public debates and enjoyed the interplay of ideas about public policy issues that they would endow a series of debates known as the Cotter Debates. And we have done this since Joe Reister. I saw you here, do you remember first year? Yeah, about 2004. They've been on a whole series of topics, international topics, uh, domestic topics, uh, uh, esoteric topics like transportation policy, healthcare policy. I think there is none that is, has been and none can be more significant than tonight's debate. Those of you who are government majors might remember that our spring lecture last year was given by Harvard professor Steve Levitsky, who with his co-author Daniel Ziblatt wrote the very influential book entitled How Democracies Die. Levitsky's talk had many of us concerned and speaking about uh, what the fate of, the, the, how awful the fate of American democracy was. But what he didn't do is talk about whether democracies were capable of responding to the threats that he saw. Tonight, we are going to do that. Uh, our speakers will give you two perspectives on the question of whether our institutions are capable of responding to populist threats to democracy. And they will do so, because I know them both, I can say this with certainty, they will do so in the best tradition of the Cotter debates. They will disagree without being disagreeable. Those who were at dinner saw that they were capable of disagreeing without being disagreeable. And they have done this for some time because our two speakers tonight team teach a course at Stanford University. <coughs> Let me introduce them both before I turn the podium over to them. The format tonight will be each of them will speak for approximately 15 minutes. Uh, and then they will have a quick opportunity to respond <coughs> to each other if they want to. And then we will turn it open to you for questions which you can address to any of them. I may intervene to introduce, to ask a question or two of my own uh, at any time, uh, preserving the prerogative of the chair to do that. First on my far left, which I find amazing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Stop there. <laughs> is my good friend David Brady. David W. Brady is the Bowen and Janice Arthur McCoy Professor of Leadership Values at the Graduate School of Business at Stanford University. He's also a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution and a professor of political science at Stanford. Prior to coming to Stanford, David taught at Kansas State University, the University of Houston, and Rice University. Uh, when he was at the University of Houston, he taught me about real football, uh, which involved a game with 80,000 people in the stands, something that I had not seen earlier in my career. Um, he is the author of many books and literally hundreds of articles. Two of his most recent books are Revolving Gridlock, um, Politics and Policy from Carter to Bush II, uh, and the Red and Blue, Blue, the Red and Blue Nation, um, both of which deal with the topic close to the one that we are speaking about tonight, Red and Blue Nation in America, I'm sorry. Uh, polarization Politics, uh, and did that with Pietro uh, Nivola at Brookings Institution. Joining David on the panel tonight is Bruce Kane. Bruce Kane is a professor of political science and the Spence and, I want to get this name right, Cleone Eccles Family Director of the Bill Lane Center for the American West at Stanford. I love that entire title. title. Uh, Bruce, who graduated from Bowdoin, <laughs> but we should not hold that against him because his brother Stephen is here tonight and his other brother both graduated from Colby and clearly outnumbered him. <laughs> Bruce got his MA from Oxford, 
and Phil from Oxford, where he was a Rhodes Scholar's PhD from Harvard, and has taught at um, Caltech and the University of California at Berkeley, and directed both the Institute for Governmental Studies at Berkeley and the University of California's Washington Center. Uh, both incredible important jobs for the UC system. My students and I have been reading Bruce's work for many years since his early work on reapportionment and his seminal work with John Fairjohn and Mo Fiorina on the personal vote. Among his most recent works is a book entitled Democracy More or Less, Americans Political Reform Quandary. Please join me in welcoming both of our speakers. Well, I could say that of um, all my recent introductions, that that's the most recent. <laughs> so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how democracies fail. So if you look at uh, if you look at populism, the claim is that Donald Trump's a populist. He's on the right. Bernie Sanders is a populist. Uh, he's on the left. And the same thing happens in Europe. Le Pen and Garrett Belders, they're on the uh, right. And uh, the populist movement in Greece and uh, Papadimus in Spain, they're on the left, OK? So what, what are the what are the sort of the criteria they do? One, they criticize the elites. But in American politics, that's nothing. Everybody, everybody runs against Washington. So that, that it's still important that they criticize the elites, but, but that doesn't matter. I think the key for a populist movement is that they are the people. They're the real people. There are others, but we're the real people. We're the real Americans. We're the real British, uh, whatever it is. And they alone represent, quote, the people. Uh, others are sort of outsiders. They're not, they're not, they're not of the same status. So there's morality. In, in the United States, populism, we have kind of limited experience. Uh, we have the 1890s. We have the uh, present period. But uh, if we look to the literature in other countries, in say, uh, Chavez in Venezuela, Erdogan in Turkey, uh, Hungary and Poland, the claim is that there are uh, three features. One, they attempt to hijack the state apparatus. Corruption is two. And uh, three, mass clientelism. But important that unlike authoritarianism, this is done in the name of the people. So let me then talk a little bit what democracies are like. So democracies, in my view, are frail. They're based on trust between all the elements. They are, in their modern format, only about 100 years old. They're characterized by universal suffrage, no slavery, regular elections with turnover, mass political parties, and a free press. That kind of democracy has failed 14 times in the last century, uh, mainly in the 1930s and then in the 1960s in Latin America. So what did democracies do when they work? They do two things, I think. They do a lot of things, but the two things that matter most are they provide social benefits and prosperity. The expectation of material progress is an essential ingredient of Western civilization for about 200 years now. That's one of the problems we have. If you were born in 1940, as I was, 95% of people born in 1940 made more money than their parents. Today, you were born in uh, 1990, less than 50%. So that's, that's sort of what they provide the progress, and that's a problem. The second thing they do is they give dignity to people to be heard, count, feel as though they matter. You have to feel as though you somehow matter. I think we have some troubles in that now. Well, when democracy works, there's kind of a rough equilibrium between elections, institutions, and policy. That's to say there are some things that can be done, some things that can't be done, but roughly, when the parties change, when things change, you don't get that much of a change. A little more of this, a little, little less of that. But it's a rough equilibrium. <clears throat> in short, that means both prosperity and uh, dignity are being delivered in sufficient quantities. When there's a breakdown, 
And that's when that equilibrium is in danger. And in the United States, that happened during the Civil War. It happened in the 1880s and 1890s, and again in the 1930s with the Great Depression. And there are still elections, there are still institutions, and there's still policy, but they're not solving problems. So as crisis looms or build, nor normal no longer works. So the pre-New Deal, there's no unemployment benefits. There's no pensions. There's no Social Security. If you have a lot of kids, your kids have to take care of you, etc. But what happens during the New Deal and the crisis, post-New Deal, and here I recommend David Kennedy's book, uh, Free From Fear. And in a post-New Deal, there is Social Security. There's unemployment compensation. There's all sorts of the welfare programs put into place during, by Roosevelt. And the parties have to adjust to that. So the Republicans a couple times run candidates who aren't for that. But in order to be competitive, the Republicans have to become the party of less welfare. Democrats are a of more welfare. But the Republicans have to give in and say, yes, we're not totally against the welfare state. And if you look, I don't have time to do it. But the same is true in Bismarck's Germany, first country to put in uh, uh, medicine for all. Uh, England under Campbell Bannerman, labor yeah, in uh, England, Ireland, Scandinavia at the turn of the century, uh, the same thing is true in all of those. In a representative democracy, then, conflict is processed only when institutions structure, absorb, and regulate conflicts that arise in society. In short, and I talk about Congress, they get short. And here I have no recommend Bruce Cain's democracy more or less, which I still will unless he attacks me too badly. In that case, <laughs> I retract it. Yeah. All right, I retract it. Don't buy the book. <laughs> Either within the party or in some bipartisan or combination thereof of internal to the parties or bipartisan. What upsets these institutional arrangements, and I'm only going to figure two of these, one, polarization. Extreme brands of polarization, which pit one group against the other, and that's sort of the anti-immigrant theme that comes across in France, it comes across in Holland, it, it comes across all around. The anti-immigrant theme, that's part of it. Failure to address the system. The failure to address, and the most important one is the failure to address issues. Increases anti-system sentiment. And I'm going to talk about two kinds of uh, issues. One is self-damaging problems, which are, I'll talk about what that means, and then big system problems. And now, if I haven't lost, I leave it over there. Yeah. I certainly hope so, because if I didn't. <laughs> so then Trump gets elected. So now we're on the present period. So, Yes, Trump is a fascist, new Republican. Trump's clown fascism, the Guardian. Trump openly supports fascists, the nation, Trevor Noah. Uh, fascists in the 30s and the 21st century, BBC News. Uh, serious scholars, Richard Evans, Tim Snyders, Kagan, Andrew Sullivan. Trump is an extinction level event. This is how fascism comes to America. So uh, this is the first sort of, uh, in my view, this is an overreaction. This is called uh, backsliding. And backsliding uh, means you're going to somehow go back to the 1930s. We're, we're going to return back to that. And at this level, um, we're not alone. So here's a few slides. This is your electoral volatility, Western European, EU countries. And you can see from 1975 to 2017, tremendous uh, increase in uh, uh, electoral volatility. And electoral volatility is roughly mentioned by the way a political party, a political party, imagine in one election it has 52%, the next election it gets 54, not much volatility. One election it gets 52 and the next election it's gone, that's volatility. So that's, that's roughly the measure of that. Uh, this is in small, uh, Austria, Denmark, Ireland, Portugal. This is in small European nations. Same thing, electoral volatility is going up. Here's Brexit. Uh, why did, why did they vote to leave Brexit? We can set our own immigration policy. The further you went from London, the greater the opposition to uh, Brexit, uh, the greater the uh, people in favor of Brexit. 
Well, part of it was the immigration issue. We can set our own immigration policy. That, that's part of that, that's crucial. We can make our own laws, and so on and so forth. Italy. This was uh, Renzi's, the first one is the vote on Renzi's thing to change the Senate so that it might, the government might be able to work. Got defeated badly. Uh, you get support for fringe parties, which are the uh, Northern League, Salvini's, these things never work. Uh, so Salvini's party and uh, Five Star Movement. So support for uh, those kind of parties is going up in Italy, the Netherlands. In 2012, Mielders, the Freedom Party, uh, had 14 seats, and the People's Party, the first one, uh, had over 40 seats. Now, even though it was held off and viewed as a victory, you can see that in the 2017 election, they went to 20 seats and cut into the People's Party. These things are building. France. In Paris, the further you were from the capital, the greater the vote for Le Pen. In uh, France, where the jobs aren't, the greater the level of unemployment, the greater the support for Le Pen. In the United States, on Super Tuesday, the counties that went for Trump are the counties where middle, uh, where white men, over, when you look at white men over time, they're aging, they're, loose, they're dying faster, which, which is very unheard of. And so the average age is 65. Somebody say the average white person dies at 83 in Palo Alto, they never die, but they die, you know. So in Palo Alto, they don't, they don't die, they got, they got to be 85, 87. But if you look at the counties that voted for Trump, and you look at it over time, it's declining. It's not raising itself, it's declining. The county uh, 10 years ago used to have white males who lived to be 73, now they're 71. So in every one of these cases, where this is happening, there's hardship. They're not fitting in with, uh, with, with, the moder with, go with globalization. And Germany's election results, where for the first time the AFD, I'll turn for Germany, uh, uh, leaves solid population and uh, the most uh, stable country in, uh, in Europe uh, changes uh, uh, probably the best leader they've had in a long time. Okay, so. Oh. One ahead. So if that's so, it's not just the United States. So if you think about populism versus uh, authoritarianism, what do we have? And I want to I want to talk about I want to talk about that again. The election of Donald Trump in the U.S. prompted a tremendous amount of commentary about this is where we're going backsliding, and I want to argue that that's wrong. It's not going to happen in the dark. Democracy is not, that's not what's going to happen in democracy. Why? In the 30s, Britain and the United States came perilously close to the abyss, but we didn't fall. Today, we look the same politically. There's Democrats, there's Republicans, there's a Congress, there's a President, there's a Labor Party, there's Conservatives, there's the House of Lords, all of that. But there have been greater, the institutions haven't changed, but what's happened around them has changed. And there are three main differences. One, we are much less violent societies today than we were then. I had a whole bunch of slides on that, but Sandy made me take them out. <laughs> so it's a contentious point, but if you look at the data, we're much less violent. And most of the stuff that happened in the 30s when the changes came, they were done violently. Two, we're so much richer now than we were. In 1929, the average per capita income was $7,000. Average, so I'm talking about comparative numbers. Uh, in 1933, that had fallen 30% to about $5,000. Today, per capita income in the United States is $57,000, which means that it's eight times higher than it was then. I don't think anyone knows how it turns out for unequal and rich relative to unequal and poor. So we were unequal and poor, now we're unequal and rich. Here's a, a, a book I recommend, The Great Leveler, Violence and the History of Inequality, Walter Scheidel. So here is the, finally the slide that I put up twice wrong. 
So this is GDP growth and inflation in Germany. You can see the tremendous drop off. So that's what happened, that the bottom fell out of the economy. Third reason, we're so much older now. Now, old people can support, uh, old people can support authoritarianism, but we can't do it. In the 30s, it was young people on the streets, not old people, and here's, here's the age gap. In the United States, the average age was 26. 1994, the average age was 34, today it's over 40. We're older. Well, what would I offer of proof is this? Greece. Look what happened in Greece. The crisis was like the 1930s, only deeper. It was a longer recession. Per capita income dropped from 30,000 in 2008 to 21,000 in five years. 25% unemployment and 50% unemployment for people 18 to 25. Why know what happened? Why no authoritarianism? Why no, why, why no backsliding? And the answer is because they were relatively rich. Where, what happened to young people, do you suppose? So if you look at Greece today, they have a lower murder rate than Britain, a lower crime rate than the US, whose economy is booming. And what happens is all those, they live at home with mom and dad. Italy, 80.6%. This is a horrible thing for your parents. Don't tell them I said this. <laughs> Slovenia, Greece, 76% of youth in Greece live at home, under 30. How many of you want to go home and live with your parents when you graduate? Uh, just the right number, zero. Um, <laughs> so what I'm suggesting is, it, it's uh, it, what backsliding looks at the wrong thing at, at the wrong place. And so, Democracy works on trust. And the rich trust that their wealth won't be taken away. Citizens believe soldiers won't turn their guns on them. The poor believe they have a chance to do better and so on. When it works, that alchemy that gives you benefits and dignity, when it fails, you backslide. And it misses the current democratic. Our democracy has not been, uh, because our world is not anti-democrat, it's, it's, it professes democracy. Our democracy has been stolen by elites, foreigners, and we will bring it back to when we were great. Sound familiar? Well, Pam, friends. In short, they defend democracy, but in the long run, it seems to me, they hollow it out. So if democracy fails, it won't fail the way it failed in the 30s. It will fail it, it, when, the, when they actually into authoritarianism, the Germans under Hitler and the Italians under Mussolini knew they didn't have a small d democracy. My fear is the institutions we presently have, the Congress, the President, the EPA, the media, the uh, Parliament, that what will happen is they'll continue to be there, will continue to have elections, but they won't solve the problems that have been arisen that have arisen. They will not be able to solve those problems. And so what will happen is democracy will hollow out. It won't look anything like, because we're richer, it won't look anything like the 1930s. I think there are two problems that are hard. I mentioned big problems are. The first big problem that's really hard to solve is global warming. Because in the first time of globalization, 1890s, it took only about one third of the world's uh, population. This covers 80 to 85 percent of the world's population, and now you have to do it. Well, you have to be able to assure growth in those countries. You have to be able to do it in an economic and environmentally sustainable way. That's a very hard problem. When we talked about it at dinner, so the problem is, if you can't get it right, you can't be held to higher standard. A lot of free riding. The Germans talk about they're so environmental, but the Germans free road free road like hell on auto emissions. They cheated on the standards and their auto emissions are actually higher than those in the United States. So what's the small issues? An example of small issues are what we are doing to ourselves through drugs, suicide, mass, incar mass incarceration of young African American men, drunk driving and so on is horrible. Look at the number of deaths caused by that. 
And these issues are never brought up in American politics. They're never brought up in election. Yet crime rates are constantly talked about in American politics. The self-damaging problem, what I meant earlier, my small, small problems, opioid use, etc. It's people making individual choices. Those are small problems in that sense, but they're hard for the government to deal with. It's hard to be there when people are making those decisions. So, and the other thing I think is really problematic, and Bruce will talk more about it, I hope, is regard to social media, the media, the effect of social media on media and the effect on democracy, I, I think it's not good. So I think, in conclusion, I believe that thus far, American institutions, with the exception of foreign policy, um, where the president can do too much on his own, but the Congress, the press, etc., most of the institutional arrangements, the courts, have held up against uh, some of the policies, so we have continue to have checks and balances. But in the long run, so in the long run, what I worry about is you get a flip-flopping of policy back and forth, back and forth. The solution, the problems don't really, really get solved. You don't benefit that set of people who have uh, been on the downside for some time. And on the other hand, you don't really give people a sense of dignity that they have some say in their lives. So you continue to have the institutions, but what happens is they haven't solved the problems. And if I had to make a guess about how democracy fails, it would be along those lines and not along the lines of backsliding. Thank you. So I've been given the task of disagreeing with Professor Brady. Hard to do, isn't it? And uh, <laughs> this is something I do with a heavy heart. <laughs> no, I don't actually. <laughs> so uh, let me put it to you, frankly. <laughs> Professor Brady raises the question backslide. And he says, nah, I don't think it's really a problem. So despite the fact that there's ample evidence that uh, democracy is failing in a fairly fundamental way in terms of people's real faith in it. Professor Brady has chosen to hit the snooze button on the alarms that are going off all around him. And I propose that we take a look at this uh, in a more immediate way. So look, there's no question, as Professor Brady says, that there's much more questioning about institutions, about democratic institutions in a fundamental way from your generation. I was at a dinner in Oklahoma, Jody and I were at dinner in Oklahoma, and we were talking about social media, and there were a couple young people that didn't speak up until the end. And uh, one guy was talking about how he's been talking with a lot of, uh, of younger people, and I've seen some polls on this, and some of the polling data suggests that your generation, you guys out there, have less faith in democratic values that is in the system actually working in a fair way, uh, that's not biased, uh, that uh, works to make things better, that can solve problems. You guys don't have any faith in that. Or at least the faith that has dropped fundamentally. So yes, there's no question that uh, Professor Brady's right. A lot of that is about the failure to actually solve very difficult problems. But I think it's deeper than that. It's also concern about uh, inequality. It's also uh, a concern about uh, the um, polarization that we have and the inability to have, uh, uh, have the kinds of conversations that we need to solve problems, etc. So I want to talk a little bit about, well, I want to ask really fundamental questions. Is it just that we're not solving problems? Let's assume, let's stipulate that solving problems is an element of that. But these are also sort of deeper contradictions in the way we think about democracy. And is it possible that Trump, for all his failings, actually is a beneficiary of this deeper ambivalence we have about democracy? Um, so I, and I, just to sort of start it off, I'll point out that when Bill Clinton was first asked to, to comment on um, George Bush when he went into Iraq, and then later uh, was asked also, I believe, about uh, Mr. Trump. One of the things he pointed out was that when he was in government, he felt that it was better to be strong and wrong than to be weak. And so then you have to ask the question, well, why would that be true? Why would that be true? And I think what he was trying to say is that 
The fundamental first purpose of any government is to secure property and lives. It's a basic, if you knew your political philosophy, it's the basic harvest assumption of why you have government, right? The state of nature is chaotic. Without it, if you want to know what the state of nature is, look at Somalia, okay? Look at the Middle East. Look at places where uh, you know, rule, rule of law is completely broken down and you see total chaos, see total violence. You see the factions fighting against each other. Uh, and so the basic concern that people have is that your number one function is to maintain order in society. And when people see disorder and they panic, they look for daddy. They look for the strong person who's going to come in and solve their problems for them. Well, it could be mommy too, but lately it's been dad. So the point is, um, strong and wrong. And then secondly, there's this other contradiction out there, which is, if you look at what happened to democratic institutions over time, and you go back to the 19th century, the notion of political leadership was uh, Burkean, that is, it was this assumption that you actually wanted people to make decisions for you. You trusted their judgment, okay? In the 20, you know, in the 20th and 21st centuries, that notion is by the boards. Basically, voters want their representatives to do what their mandate is and to deliver goods for them, to make them better. And there's far little deference, far, far at all, far, practically no deference whatsoever, <coughs> added to the transparency that we have in democracy that probably produced a kind of mystical shroud that allowed us to believe that leaders were not just human beings that with failings that had sex with their you know chief of staff that weren't just people that um, you know that that lied or they were you know that there was myth that that made you believe that these people were better and and even in our era if you look at JFK we had political heroes I don't believe with the exception maybe of Bernie <laughs> that anybody really thinks of these you know these leaders as heroes you guys are simple, you know, right? That's, that's the stance that your humor is that way. And that's been going on for about 20 or 30 years. So we don't have a myth that allows us to believe that somehow these people are acting in our best interest. And so we increasingly push to have more control over them. But here's the problem. We don't really know enough to have control of them. We don't know enough about what's going on in the Middle East to know whether or not we should have more troops or fewer troops. We don't know them enough about the very complicated way the stock market works to have new laws and regulations. So the problem is just at the time when, and here's a fundamental contradiction, when we feel like we ought to have more control, we have, we don't have the knowledge to really exercise that control in a responsible way. Okay. So when we're undermining representative institutions and saying we ought to have more control and take and I was mentioning this, Brexit as an example. The British public was asked to, to come up with a very, a solution to a very complex problem, which is should Britain should be, remain in the EU. Now, I don't know how many of you read, how many people have actually read about the EU or actually read a book or taken a class on the EU. It is a very complicated subject, full of very complicated regulations. What are the odds that your average citizen has the slightest understanding about how the, they missed a big one. They missed a big one, that is, they didn't even know that this had implications for Northern and Southern Ireland. Okay, that was a biggie. There was a big civil war for decades. And now the whole question of whether you're gonna put a border up between North and Southern Ireland didn't come up in the minds of a lot of people that voted for that. So what makes us think that we can govern any better than the bozos we have in office, right? Because they're bozos like us. But at least they have the time and effort to actually study it. So this fundamental challenging of democratic institutions, I think, is what Professor Brady has, I think, underestimated. And it's been going on for quite a while. Even before Trump, there were a lot of trends that were undoing the way in which American democracy in particular operated. So we, we're very proud of checks and balances for reasons we were talking about at dinner, which is to say, we believe that there should be a consensus that emerges out of uh, you know, both parties and as many interest groups as possible 
uh, because we believe that produces stable policy, which makes it easier to actually make investments and have business prosper, and you don't have constant reversals of policy. Okay, so that was kind of the premise of the, that we had uh, all through when we were teaching political science about the value of the institutions we had, that the uh, the federalism system, the division of power, even our electoral system. All this was uh, taking a society which was extremely diverse and therefore could easily fall into factions. It was taking it and providing institutions that forced people to get out of their corners and make compromise. That was it. That was the genius of that institution, okay? But what's been happening even before Mr. Trump? Well, first of all, Congress really has dropped the ball. And part of it has to do with polarization. Because what polarization does is it takes the natural features of American democracy and exaggerates them. So the natural features of democracy is that when you have divided government, the threshold of consensus has to go up because you have to get the other party on board. So you have to change you have to negotiate, you have to make more compromises, right? Um, and, uh, and the filibuster adds to that, right? But the impatience that we had with that during the Obama administration, because what happened under the Obama administration? They had two years, Democratic control, they were held up somewhat by the filibuster and conservatives in the Senate, weren't able to do the climate change legislation. But then, because of the uh, Obama's health care, ACA, and the reaction of, the, of some people to that system, we had a, a Republican takeover of the Congress, and suddenly Obama no longer had the legislative authority to go forward and pass new legislation. So what did he do? He enacted a whole bunch of executive actions. And I'm gonna say, that's kind of a metaphor for the problem that we were talking about, because these executive actions, what can be done by executive actions can be undone by executive actions. So the, the short term, value that you got in, in DACA and DAPA and uh, various other pieces of executive action, which we like, the, the, the clean power plan, all that stuff, um, that was easily undone when the administration changed. So th this gets to the point, well, if you're trying to solve serious problems like the healthcare crisis or climate change, you can't have a solution that only lasts a couple years. So that means that we have to come to grips with a fundamental fact. And that fundamental fact is that Democrats and Republicans at this moment are more evenly divided, especially when you throw in the independents, than in any period in the post-war. Okay, in any period in the post-war. And you cannot, one party by itself cannot operate alone. So if Elizabeth Warren says, well, I'm gonna go up there and fight for Democratic principles, well, that's fine, but at some point, you gotta make some compromise because you're not gonna have the votes otherwise, right? <coughs> So the rise of executive actions was already taking a lot of authority away from Congress, already weakening the checks and balances, okay? Uh, the hollowing out of congressional practice, uh, processes, I don't know whether Sandy assigned Barbara Sinclair's work, but Barbara Sinclair is one of these people that really went in, and, uh, like Fenno, and looked at what was happening in congressional procedure. And to make a very complicated story simple, the decline in committees, the decline in uh, you know, oversight activities and, and uh, including members of the other party into deliberations and uh, all, all the stuff, the games that we're seeing right now, evolved over time because what was happening is as one party was using their opposition to obstruct, the other party was changing the rules to undo the obstruction. And so you got an escalation of short-circuiting the whole democratic process in Congress. And so when people say, well, let's restore what we had in the 1950s and 50s and 60s, you can't do that very easily. Because it's there for a reason. It didn't happen accidentally. It happened for a reason, okay? The third is the polarization. And that's another topic that we could have hours of discussion about. Let me give you a one-line, simple uh, understanding of what happened. What basically happened was what we call party sorting. Basically, you had two parties that were relatively heterogeneous coalitions. You had liberal Republicans with conservatives in the Republican Party, and you had Southern Democrats who were conservatives and liberals in the Democratic Party. And then what you had was the signing of the Civil Rights Act in particular, uh, but there were other laws as well, that caused the South to realign, and it caused uh, Democrats to pick off the liberal Republicans. So where you used to have, if you think of two bell curves, that overlapping, where some of the conservative Democrats were more conservative than the liberal Republicans, that space is gone. 
That space is gone. You've got much more homogeneous parties now. So how do we get that back? Okay. And then we have the rise of social media, which I, I will talk about a little bit more in a second. So here's a question. Is democracy itself too fragile to handle the problems? Is it possible that at least the democratic form of, uh, the, form of the American form of democracy, is it possible that that only worked perfectly or nicely in the aftermath of World War I and World War II, when we were all on the same page because we were fighting fascism and we were fighting the communists? Uh, communists. <coughs> Is it possible that then everybody was willing to make the sacrifice in terms of taxes, making the sacrifice in terms of getting on the same page? Um, or if, that, if we don't have a war that unites us, I, I was always struck, for example, in the, uh, in the Afghan war, that my generation was very anti-war because many of us were asked to go fight in a war which we didn't believe in, okay? And I saw overnight when the United States was attacked uh, in New York, I saw people that were adamant pacifists for 20 years flip on a dime. Flip on a dime. And put flags on their cars and become pro-American. Not a bad thing. But I'm just saying that having lived 40 years through these drastic changes and watching generations flip in their attitudes like that. How can we be sure that we are, that democracy isn't so fragile that it could flip in terms of democratic, other democratic values, right? In other words, if changes can happen that rapidly under drastic conditions, that the economy were totally to collapse, or if we were to uh, get into a terrorist attack, which is even worse than the one we had before, but they unleash, uh, if you like, uh, chemical weapons or biological weapons or Whatever, you know, it's entirely possible that we could flip, we could become a much more authoritarian government overnight. So I don't think it's, even though I don't think this is going to happen tomorrow, and I, I don't want people to have nightmares, I think you have to run scared when you have a democracy. You have to assume that just like the climate is fairly fragile, as we've, as we've discovered, and it has, it takes constant mitigation and constant conservation to maintain the climate, I would say political institutions similarly are fragile and need to be uh, intended to. So let me just finish off by talking about what I think are some key challenges that I worry about, <coughs> worry about democracy. First of all is the social media. Now, we have had transformations in communication before. When radio came in, we had Father Cochran, who was a populist. <coughs> and when TV came in, we had uh, people who were similarly using TV, uh, and we had talk radio, and we had TV shows that whipped up uh, basically partisan divisions. You started to see news broadcasts where people really just argued back and forth. It, wasn't, it was regarded too boring to have sort of sensible discussion between moderate people, so you look for people that said polarizing things, and they got their ratings up, okay? So, but now we have a third stage, which is social media. In many ways, I think this is much more fundamental and harder to understand. Because we could control the airwaves through the uh, FCC. We could control, we had fair use doctrine about how, you know, how much people could present on one side versus the other, and uh, we don't have that anymore. And moreover, there are parts of the internet where we have no control whatsoever, right? The dark part of the, uh, the internet, we have no control. And the velocity with which things spread in the internet takes political dialogue, which is already superficial and makes it even more superficial. And you guys are moving away from Facebook into things like Instagram and I don't know, God knows what else, but a lot of that is visual and it's even shorter than, you know, the three minute commercials, right? It's an image. What do images do? Talk to political consultants. Why do they use images? Because images have more <coughs> emotional impact than speeches by Bruce Cain or David Brady. Okay? We produce apathy. They produce emotions, right? Okay. And that's, that's what ads are all about. They, they engage you on an emotional level, not just on a cognitive level, and a lot of the social media does that. Secondly, inequality. We haven't talked about inequality. But David did. He mentioned that the disparities in wealth have gotten a lot greater. Well, here's an interesting thing. Democracy is premised on the notion that everybody's vote is equal. One person, one vote. But in reality, if you have a lot more money and resources than another person, you still only have one vote, but you have a lot of influence. 
You have a lot of abilities to not, in, not only influence voters, but you have the ability to influence elected officials. Not so much when the voters care about something, but when voters don't care about something, you have a lot of influence. And so there's this fundamental tension, really, that comes up in campaign finance reform and various other things, between the stated goal of equality and the reality of increasing inequality of resources. Um, thirdly, as David, and I won't dwell on this, but this notion of free trade and the free movement of labor. One of the central functions of government, and national governments in particular, aside from security, is to provide for the prosperity and well-being of a particular country, right? And so, we have known in political science for decades that you can basically run equations before the election where you just put in the economic conditions, GDP growth, inflation growth, etc. And if those indicators are bad enough, you already know before they start the campaign what's going to happen. Okay? So the reality is these are issues that really get to what is the role of nation states. And you have to remember that nation states were relatively recent in the history of politics, right? And now the question is, and I think it comes up in Brexit, it comes up in NAFTA, it comes up in the trade agreements, because the trade agreements are rarely just about free trade, they're about fairness in uh, labor policy, or in wages, or in environmental policy. So in reality, all the sort of debates that you have within a, a polity are put into the the trade debate. So really we're arguing about where does sovereignty lie? Where does the decision making lie about all these critical issues? That's a serious question. A serious question. And people who are used to it being done at the national level are of course going to be a little confused if it's done uh, particularly by an unelected body as, uh, as happens in the EU. And then lastly, let me just say something about the climate change. I agree with many of you who say that climate change is really uh, the biggest challenge that we have. But as David points out, it's not a challenge that can be won within any one jurisdiction. Right? It's one that's going to have to be done internationally, uh, it's got to be done across different states, and it's going to mean doing painful things that people don't want to do. And so if we're in a political system where nobody wants to talk about the painful things, they want to deliver the goodies only, we're not going to have a serious discussion about doing anything about climate change, period. Until we stop talk about what we're willing to give up, what we're willing to pay, what we're willing to do. So that's a, another problem with representative democracy. In some ways, you often see, actually, among the scientists, a kind of China envy. A China envy <laughs> for authoritarianism. Because the Chinese were able to, to turn off the smog for their Olympics by simply saying to the factories, oh no, you can't operate as much as you want. Turn that down. Okay? Or they decided in a recent party convention that they would start to take climate change more seriously, and so they're, they're, they're going forward on green energy. So here's an interesting problem. What if capitalism and authoritarianism work better than capitalism and democracy? Are we always going to be at a disadvantage? And if we're not, how do we make sure that we're not? How can we act in a decisive way on these critical challenges? So, Professor Brady, yes, there are some policy disagreements, but I think there's a much deeper sense of, sense of angst that our institutions are not up to the challenge of the day. I'm going to exercise the prerogative of the chair and not let you respond to each other. Whoa, well, because <laughs> at, the end. at the end, maybe, because I want the students to have a chance to ask some questions. I assume we've got microphones somewhere. Is that true, Sherry? Yeah. And I will, uh, while the microphones are getting started out, I'm going to ask just one quick question. I'd like you each to answer in just a minute or so, because I saw a theme between the two of you, uh, which dealt with the fact that we have an uninformed uh, electorate. And I'm wondering if there is a role for the media uh, that can be an effective role in informing people about issues, about consequences, about promises made and not kept those kinds of things. Whatever you ask, I'm going to respond to Bruce. Okay. <laughs> uh, I was afraid of that, so I just thought I'd a question. Well, yeah. I think it, it goes back to uh, what Bruce said about um, 
you know, basically the Burkean point, when you have representatives, you trust your representative or they simply can put a mandate. And so, in one sense, uh, the press, in the days uh, when I was growing up, there were only three TV stations, Walter Cronkite was the voice of America, uh, an event occurred, the Kennedy assassination, and you got one interpretation, basically. And those news organizations were worried about the facts, they were worried about trying to be fair, and I think uh, what's happened is, just as we no longer have this great trust in our representatives to do what's right, we don't trust the media, we trust our media. We don't trust your media. So basically, depending upon your viewpoint of the world, you can find a TV station, you can find a podcast, you can find anything, and just listen, and just listen to that. And that certainly is a uh, change that's very important and the problem is how do we get at what the real set of facts are so that enough people know what they are that you might get reasonable responses. Yeah, you know, I just don't see, um, right now we're asking private companies like Facebook to police uh, their, the, the postings to take out things that are false and you know they've hired what 17,000 people to read these posts. Apparently it's a burnout job because what you read is really depressing. Uh, at least you're thinking of doing that. Uh, but, but, you know, I just think that's a temporary action. Uh, in, in the long run, uh, I think people have got to learn to be suspicious. And I think you guys probably are. Uh, I think there are a lot of other people that are not in college or, you know, not as sophisticated or live in bubbles where they're not it never occurs to them to look to the other side. And I think it goes back, I mean, I hate to say it, but I think it goes back to civic education, that somewhere along the line, we abandoned having civic education in high school that was really serious. And I think that the way to restore it is not to have people memorizing the names of famous leaders and all that kind of stuff, but actually teaching people how to negotiate, how, right from the early age. And I think, uh, there are several groups that are working on this in, in uh, the Silicon Valley. They're basically working on virtual reality simulations where you are put in a community uh, setting and your job is to try to create uh, an agreement about putting a park in place or raising money. Uh, and that that's, I think, the way you would teach that. Something going on here. Thank you. Questions? Uh -huh. Um, I just have a question about... Can we introduce yourself? We'll just say who you are and where you're from. Uh, my name is Isaac Vernon. I'm from New York City. Um, and I'd just like both of you to speak a little bit more to what degree you think social media by our political leaders could be damaging our unity as a country. And whether or not the, whether or not the blame rests on the people in social media or the politicians. You think. Well, I would say all of the above. I mean, I, I, I do think that uh, there's no question that, uh, you know, I, I don't want to sound too political, but obviously I believe that President Trump misused social media and has problems with the truth. Uh, but, you know, leaving that aside, it's in, there's no question what's going to happen in the future. And the future of politics and political campaigning is increasingly going to migrate into social media. And it would have happened sooner, but inside campaigns, the campaign managers and the media buyers were a little bit slow on the uptake to figure out how important social media would be. And it's not just young people that are on social media. Uh, the, 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 the group that is using Facebook the most, that is the growth area for Facebook is actually, um, you know, people who are older. And so the reality is that uh, while Facebook, uh, while social media is being more fractured in terms of uh, different age groups using different social media, that's where it's all going. And so we have to learn how to make people more discerning because there's no way we're going to be able with the ethos of the internet and the First Amendment protections that we have in this country, there's no way we're going to be able to go through every single message and screen out ones that are wrong. That's just not gonna work. So it's gonna be up to the consumer 
to ask questions. It would be helpful, I think, if if we develop AI enough to sort of target and identify where something comes from. So if we if we know it's coming from a bot, if we know it's coming from a particular country, and you warn people about it, but I I would still say, okay, then it's up to you to know, okay, this is a Russian message or this is a message from Iran or whatever, you know, uh, and then you can determine based on that whether you want to accept the information. But I don't see as a free country our ability to really censor. I think that takes us down the wrong path. Uh, I don't disagree with that. Uh, it does seem to me that it would be better if we knew how people use um, the media, use social networks, particularly uh, Facebook, and what effects it had. So we probably, if this was three years from now, we'd be better off because uh, Facebook agreed with YouGov, a polling company, to give fifth. So YouGov has 50,000 people who are on Facebook. And during this election cycle, all 50,000 people have agreed to allow face uh, to allow you come Facebook to look at all the things and all the sites they look at and how they vote, and so are asking questions from the YouGov perspective and the other. So we should have uh, a much better uh, perspective on who uses Facebook and how it affects things. I do think it affects. Uh, I do think it affects things, but it would be useful to get to the solutions Bruce suggested if we knew a little bit more about how it was used and who it was affecting. Who was affected more, actually. Questions? Hi, my name is Katie Ferguson. I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota. And I have a question for Professor Brady. Um, you talked about, and I agree with your opinion on the of democracy, but one of your major points was that America is far richer, and you said well, eightfold. Um, but I was wondering if that accounts for a inflation of basic items and b the addition of not, like new necessities like smartphones and laptops and the increased price of college education, which is like now a necessity for any decent paying. Job. Um, the answer is it is average in terms of two thousand. So it's an av it, the number is average and uh, normalized. So that the, the one figure is eight times bigger than the others in terms of purchasing price parity, which is what could you buy for that, that amount of money. Uh, so that much is true. Uh, in regard to, uh, the second question was about tuition. Tuition, other, and like the addition and development of technology and other things that now are a cost to Americans uh, that weren't in the 1930s. No, when there's so tuition, relatively speaking, the problem with tuition is wasn't the tuition wasn't high at Harvard and the few, it was that so few people were getting educated. I think the number of college graduates in the United States in the 1880s and 90s is less than 5%. So today, you have many more people going to college than about 20, 30, what Bruce, like 30% are graduates of college now. So that has, that has expanded it. And, and the argument is, well, it's expanded it, but you're better off with the education and you're gonna earn more money. But the problem with that is two things. One, it increases the inequality gap. And the second thing is there's something called associative mating. And it turns out that in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, uh, people from different social classes would uh, intermarry more. That happens less uh, because you marry later. And the result of that is, say, take my daughters, uh, in the 1960s, uh, my, uh, one of my daughters would have gotten married. Yes, they've all done very well. They get, they get married, they quit working and take care of the children. They don't quit working now. So instead of having a household that has one $250,000 or $200,000 uh, breadwinner, now that's doubled and it's now four hundred dollars or 500000 which increases the inequality. So the advances in education have led to, have exacerbated the problem of inequality, which I think the real problem for capitalism to solve is how can it, how can, through democracy, we bring about a leveling off some, some change in the inequality levels so that it's able to do both those things. And I think now there is an alternative model, which is uh, the Chinese model, as you look around the world, which is to say you can have capitalism, and it can work just fine, and you don't have to have a democracy. So I think this is the first time there's been an alternative model uh, of governance uh, out there. 
And I think we always assumed in the past that if you had democracy and you had capitalism, over the long run, there'd be problems along the way, but but it would work out. That, that's not so clear now. I'm Cassidy. I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota as well. Um, I have a question for Professor King. Um, Tim, earlier you spoke about how one of the big problems with democracy, especially among our generation, is that people don't trust it anymore. Or the, um, or the trust is falling, but then you kind of, you said a few minutes ago that rather than censoring social media, we need to be able to kind of discern, differentiate what's true, what's factual. But it seems to me that those two are almost mutually exclusive because if we're taught to constantly question social media and the sources and what we see, how is then we're inherently going to question I think the government a lot more and everything with it. So how can we kind of build trust but also question the sources? Well, um, good point, uh, because I actually want you to be skeptical about both, but I don't want you to mistake um, in, well, or let's put it this way, I want you to, I believe that if you work through, as many of us in political science have for decades, what are the alternatives? You come to the conclusion, and it's an old saying, that democracy is flawed, but it's the best of the alternatives. Because in the end, the problem with authoritarianism without accountability is it could produce a very, very good outcome if your leader is, uh, you know, is well intended. But all too often, it leads to corruption, fundamental corruption, and it leads to uh, very bad decision making because it's one person making their mind up rather than taking information. If you think about the theory of information, you're better off hearing from a lot of different sources. So I actually believe that if you think about it long enough and hard enough, you you see the value of democracy. But there, the word democracy is a is a is a term that covers a lot of different forms of democracy. And what we call democracy in the late 18th, early 19th century is not what you guys would call democracy right now. Women couldn't vote, African Americans couldn't vote, uh, we didn't have direct elections in the Senate, uh, the Electoral College operated differently. So democracy is constantly evolving and we have to figure out ways to make it evolve with the social media because it, it's, it's going to be there. Um, it's going to be the way that you get most of your information. Uh, newspapers will pretty much be all online. You know, there won't be many people using dead tree versions, uh, visions of it, because after all, we need the trees, right? <laughs> so, but, but what I'm getting at is, I, I think, yes, I want you to be skeptical about the information that you get, and I want you to look at both sets. So I always say to students, and it's something we always teach, which is you get a viewpoint, and you don't get happy with that viewpoint. You don't just sit with that viewpoint. You always ask yourself, what are the arguments against that? Well, what is that person who doesn't agree with me? What does that person really think? So it could be sympathy with that person, but it can be empathy, where you're trying to put yourself in that person's mindset and trying to understand why they might object to the viewpoint that you take. And then you say to yourself, okay, what can I do to either change that view or to compensate that view? Economists talk about that all the time. You know, what can I do to compensate? Maybe there are ways to compensate. So if people disagree in extractive states about climate change, then we should be stopping and thinking about, well, how do you include them in the high-tech economy? How do you include them in the green economy? How do you make sure that all the businesses aren't in San Francisco and in New York? How do you get it out into the West? So I think once you start to understand, well, wait a minute, they're, look, they're, they want to have a living. They want to have a job with dignity. I think you said that earlier. Yeah. Okay, if they want a job with dignity, you can't just sort of say, ah, blow off the middle of the country, we don't care. We don't care that we've hollowed out their industries. We don't care that we've sent jobs over to Mexico and China. And, I mean, I think the Democratic Party made a big mistake by not taking, the, the worst thing that can happen in democracy is downward mobility, you know? The large numbers of people are downwardly mobile, and David really started off his talk that way. Unfortunately, I agree with him a lot, so this yeah. debate is kind of falling apart. But anyway, um, <laughs> but the bottom line is, if people are, are you know, not doing as well as their parents, that's, 
and the large numbers of people, so there are always going to be some people. That that is very corrosive. That was one of the not the only, but one of the uh, the elements of fascism. And that's why we, if you if you're so <coughs> proud of your high tech and you're so in your bubble and you're you're marrying people that are also in the bubble and everybody's in the bubble, then you're not going to have empathy for what's going on in the rest of the country. <laughs> and one of the things we try to do is get Stanford students who are totally bubble oriented out of the bubble and get them to see what's going on. And you leave Seattle and you go to the eastern part of Washington State, all of a sudden you saw Trump signs. And, and, you know, and you have to try to understand where that's coming from. So again, uh, I would say keep your skepticism, but as a way of challenging yourself to have the best views that you can have based on the evidence. I just want to say one thing. So when you, in regard to the point Bruce made about authoritarian government, authoritarian governments, they can make decisions, but so think of the thing I said about the dignity. Authoritarian governments uh, make decisions, but and they don't, they're not looking for dignity among the people. The, the, the bet is, hey, we can keep growing the economy at this level, it'll get distributed. That, that's their bet. The bet is, we'll run it from the top, and what people really want is economic security. That's what, that's what it's about. The, the other side of the problem is that what we have in the United States, and I think what we've been talking about, is in the United States what we have is too much of that, too many, many people think their dignity has been hurt, uh, so on and so forth, and the result is we can't do anything. We, ha we, have, we have the people who, so who's, who's wounded most? Uh, the people in the Midwest, they've lost their jobs. No, that's not it. It's lesbian, gay, uh, bisexual, transgender. There's the identity politics. Everybody's in that game, and it makes it very hard to do things. So they're, they're kind of the reverses, and we have to figure out, I think, ways, democracies, have to figure out ways to get beyond that inaction and do something that actually solves the problems, whereas authoritarian governments have a totally, uh, they, have, they don't have any trouble deciding but they don't, they don't care much about dignity at that level. Uh, my name is John Leishner, I'm a sophomore from West Harvard, Connecticut. I know you, uh, Professor Kennedy, had cited social media as uh, something that kind of tears away the fabric of democracy. And I just wanted to ask you what your thoughts were, and perhaps uh, the integrity of the that mass media in general, perhaps so that's changed to Walter Cronkite, and uh, if so, you know how that plays a role in uh, the divisiveness of the integrity of the media. Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah, I'm, it's. I think the role of the journalist has changed a lot. Um, so when I was growing up, you would actually go to the paper to learn about what happened the day before. Now, when you go to the paper, you already know what happened the day before because you got it on your phone and you've already seen that. And so the role of the newspapers in reporting events kind of uh, got a lower priority. And what happened is the newspapers became more what Newsweek and Time were in the previous era. That is to say, they started to try to explain things. And when you try to explain things, you're getting further away, you're getting into the territory of making assumptions about how what caused things uh, that can look to other people as biased. So I don't know that today's journalists are any more virtuous or less virtuous than they used to be, but I think the expectations of fighting for a declining market because fewer people are reading newspapers, you guys don't buy newspapers, apparently you believe that the news can be generated for free, nobody has to actually get paid to do it. I got news for you that doesn't work that way. You will eventually pay for it. Uh, but you know, uh, the bottom line is that uh, you know we we we've had this transformation, and I don't think the people have changed, but I think the role has changed, and I think the pressure on so number one is the role's changed more to analysis and less to actual reporting of the facts, and then uh, number two is the economic pressure that many of these. The Washington Post, the New York Times are doing okay, but many of the papers are going under. Uh, TV stations have had to move more to news and weather because people do not want to hear a lot about politics. And so it's, it's, it's a very hard time to be in journalism. And I think the, that when you get in a job, you respond to the incentives uh, 
that are put before you on what makes you advance. So that's not to justify what seems like you know a lot of biases in the media, but it's to explain how we got there as compared to the earlier period. And I don't know what we can do to reverse that, which is why I want to come back to the notion we have to become more sophisticated. We have to be more aggressive about trying to read alternative sources of things so that we, we don't get in the truth bubble. Because it's very easy to get in the truth bubble. If you look at the Pew data, the Pew data actually, uh, Pew has a, a project on journalism, and you can look at the readership of different media by their party, uh, the party bias of the people that read it, and you see that even in, you know, what we regard as mainstream media like the New York Times and Washington Post have a, very, a real skew in terms of uh, people's ideology. So you got to work very hard to get out of your bubble and try to hear what's, uh, however painful it is, what's being said, you know, who, who are the most sensible people on the other side that can give you some glimmer of understanding uh, so that you can develop that empathy so you can think of ways of solving problems. So I, again, journalists drink less actually. Probably, in some ways, much more decent people than they used to be. Uh, it's just that the professional incentives are screwed up. David, you want the last word? I like it better when you're drinking more. <laughs> So, please join me in giving Wait a minute, professors. Did you, did you an do you want? Do you want I asked him if he wanted more time, and he made a joke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, David, do you want? Do you want to respond? We we don't encourage you. We, no, I, I'm. I'm uh, we all join me in thanking professors. <laughs>